Hey, hey, y'all. This is CR Waters with another episode of Too Beautiful to Be Broken. First, today I want to apologize for the fact that today is Wednesday instead of Monday. I had a kind of crazy weekend. My birthday was last Thursday, so I was out of town for the weekend and everything kind of got behind. So I am back on track now. So my next podcast will be on Monday, like it's supposed to be. So before we start, uh, let me remind you guys, if you guys want to contact me, uh, please send me a message at cr.waters at aol.com, or you can leave me a message at 951-208-4709. I'll respond to the messages that you guys leave me. If you're having a hard time with anything right now, please, please, please reach out to somebody close to you, your pastor, a friend, a family member. Um, you can always reach out to me. But don't ever think that you need to to handle whatever it is you're going through by yourself. So today I'm going to tell you guys a love story. This love story starts out a long time ago, like the beginning of the last century, so around the 1900s. At that time in history, yeah, a lot of people were coming over here from from Europe, you know, make a better life for their family, you know, the new world, so to speak, and. I know that um, a lot of different people from countries um, came to New York. Uh, that's where all the boroughs in New York came from. So we, you know, had Italian, Irish, English, you know, French, Spanish, you know, coming over from Europe. And some of them landed, or a very large chunk of them landed in New York, and a lot of them went to Boston. And then some um, finished their their um, trek in California. So this story is about an Italian family that came over here from an island off of Sicily and they settled in a little fishing town in Northern California called Pittsburgh. I know there's a lot of Pittsburghs, but this one in particular is in California. So on September 9th, 1946, a young man was born in Pittsburgh, raised there in a very large Italian family. When he was 17, he joined the Navy. Started out in, you know, at that time in San Diego. Uh, then in 1967, he was um, moved to uh, Long Beach and was stationed there aboard the USS Edson. Uh, at this point in time, he'd already been to Vietnam once. And um, so during his stay in Long Beach, he met a girl who lived in Long Beach with her parents. And they were out with, um, you know, their friends and met each other and got to know each other and, and ended up over the next few months in a relationship. Um, cared a lot about each other until uh, her dad found out about it and made it very apparent that he did not like sailors. So basically, you know, told the young man, you know, that he needed to make himself scarce or, you know, there would be repercussions. So, reluctantly, they broke up and, and you know, went, went their own ways. Uh, he did, however, try to contact her several times, but was never allowed to talk to her. One day, uh, one of her friends came to him and told him that she might be pregnant but that if she was, her parents were going to send her to Oregon to get an abortion. From that point on, he never heard another thing, so he assumed that either she wasn't pregnant, or that if she was, she was, she was, you know, forced to, to have an abortion. So, you know, he just kind of left it alone. He thought about her often, you know, wanted to contact her, you know, wondered how she was doing. But, you know, he knew that her father would never allow him to contact her. So in February of 1968, he was sent to Vietnam again. This time he was there until October of 1968. She was really sad that her dad made them, made them break up because she liked him a lot. She didn't understand why her dad, dad didn't like sailors. Um, I think she figured it was more her mom than her dad, but it didn't really matter because, you know, they'd broken them up. And it wasn't too long 
um, after they broke up that she found out that she was she found out she was pregnant. Her parents had um, gone to her doctor and um, you know basically almost insisted that she have an abortion. The doctor, however, was on her side and told him it was too late for that. During this time in history, having a baby when you were unwed was was taboo. It was frowned upon very, very highly. Um, you know, and her parents, um, you know, like a lot of other ones in that same time period, were basically embarrassed by her, what they considered, mistake. So, like a lot of parents, when these things happened, they sent her to live with a Jewish family in Brentwood. Um, and when she had the baby, she would go home and, and the deed would never be spoken of again. So on June 6, 1968, at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, she gave birth to a little baby girl. It was a Catholic hospital. So she had her C-section and the baby was immediately removed from the room and she was told she would never see her again, that she was going to be sent to an adoption home to be adopted by uh, a Christian couple. So, though she wanted to see her, um, she knew she wouldn't be able to. Right before she was discharged, however, a, a nurse had pity on her and um, brought the baby by to see her. Even though she wasn't allowed to hold her or touch her, she at least got to see her from the door. But that would be the only time that, that she would get to see her. Her parents never came and visited, at the, visited her at the hospital and never once saw the baby. <coughs> That's how adoptions were done in those days, and it's, it's a sad, and I think it's a sad reflection on where our world was at that point. Pregnancies to unwed mothers and unwanted pregnancies are going to happen. They just are. But I think doing an adoption that way is not good for, for the baby at all. Adoptions now are done open. The biological parents can still be involved on some level if they want to be. And in my opinion, I think that's the best way to do it because, you know, a child can never have too many people that love that child. They, they can, there's never a time when you can say, oh, you've got too many people that love you. So anyway, off my soapbox and back to our story. So after the baby was born, she went home and, and went back to her life. And um, you know, the baby was put in a, a Christian adoption agency and adopted by um, a Christian couple, an older couple, and they, you know, took her home and, and made her their own and loved her, and, you know, she had a, a pretty good life. Uh, her mom told her every day a story of, you know, bedtime, she told her a story every day about a little girl who was wanted more than anything, who was loved, and the luckiest girl in the world, and at the end of the story, she would always, you know, kiss her forehead and poke her nose and tell her, and that little girl was you. Um, when she was in kindergarten, one of the girls in her kindergarten class found out she was adopted and was just devastated by it. So, in case you hadn't guessed by now, you know, this is my story. And I was raised by a, a wonderful family, a mother that I, I don't, I can't imagine having a better mother. She was supportive and loving and there for me no matter what. And she was just the epitome of what an amazing mother is. And I never once questioned whether I was loved. So, you know, that, I think that, that adoption in that instance is, is a good thing because if you don't have what you need to give the baby or you can't be there to, you know, to give that baby what it needs, you know, letting somebody who, who wants a baby is a great thing. 
and I wouldn't change how I grew up, but I know that there was always a little piece missing. And I'm sure for most adopted kids, that's true. I never wanted to look for my biological parents because I didn't want to hurt, you know, my parents. Uh, my mom was amazing and I didn't want to make her feel like I didn't want her to be my mom. Um, until I was early 30s and started having medical problems and realized that I needed answers. So, you know, I started looking around and, and I actually found um, my biological mom pretty quickly. And, you know, I, I called her and, you know, that's always a call that, that is never easy to make. You know, it's a, a cold call on the phone and you're not sure whether the person on the other end of the phone is going to respond to you or how they're going to act. So, but I called and I talked to her and, and, you know, I still have contact with her now. And um, I have two sisters on that side and, and um, two beautiful nieces from, from one sister and three from the other. And it's... It's a connection, you know, that, that I think at some point in my life I needed to make. And I got my answers. Um, I was not able to find my biological da dad at that time because um, there was a little bit of confused information when it came to him. Um, they called him Tony. They called him Skip. Um, but his real name was actually um, Nino. And so in finding him, I was not using the right, you know, name. So about, uh, I think maybe four or five years ago, my um, uh, daughter decided that she was going to do 23andMe because she wanted to know all the specifics of her ancestry for something that she was doing um, uh, for school. Uh, so I went and, you know, she wanted me to, you know, and her brothers to, to all do it. So I did. And they come back with, I mean, I get, I get updates from them all the time about genetic testing and this thing and that thing. and you know, are all your closest, you know, related people, and so, but I noticed, oh, I don't know, about a month or so ago, I noticed on there that I had a first cousin that we would be connected by grandparents. I thought, hmm, okay, well, so I did my little, you know, people finder and tell us thing online, and located him, and called him, which of course was another fun call, you know, you got to dry call people and try to explain it to them and, you know, you're not exactly sure how they're going to take the fact that you're telling them that, you know, you may be related to them and that you were adopted and, you know, you don't want to go in and disrupt anybody's life. So I called him and, and he was incredibly receptive and very positive and, you know, told me a little bit about the family and, and you know, where they came from and then he gave me um, the number of, of a couple of his cousins, um, one of which uh, was in the Navy in 1967 in Long Beach. So through the whole entire thing, I managed um, to find my biological dad. And you know, well, I wasn't sure how he was going to respond or react or, or, you know, if he would be accepting or... Um, and he was very much so. He was um, very happy, very open, very accepting, um, you know, surprised to say the least because um, he never knew, but uh, happy nonetheless. So I've, um, you know, I haven't confirmed, you know, DNA just yet, but I'm going to, to do that just to, you know, be on the safe side. But I am... I am blessed if indeed, you know, this this is my family because from everybody that I've talked to in this family, they are very accepting and very open and very loving. Uh, and on this side, I would have two brothers and a sister and a whole, whole lot of nieces and nephews and cousins and, and all kind of other stuff. So um, it to me, I think the idea of adoption is beautiful. I do, however, think that if it can be an open adoption and both, you know, the, the biological parents, if they want to be involved, it can be involved, is a good thing. Because I always had so many questions growing up, you know, who I looked like, where I came from, um, you know, 
any you know breast cancer you know heart disease you know I mean just there's a lot of questions in my mind and you know those are all things that you know as as we grow up and we have medical issues and whatever else are are important to know so um, anyway it was it was a love story and it was a love story on all levels because you know they they had a relationship and, and cared very deeply for each other and you know I was adopted but I was loved very much and I still you know am so so blessed to to have my mom she's 90 years old um, and lives with me and you know I mean I feel blessed to have found my biological parents as well because now I I, I have a connection in this world with them as well and I know where I came from and and you know what's in my family history and what medical issues I have so I I've, I gotta say that I feel like I, I am truly blessed I have an amazing mother I've got incredible children uh, incredible daughter-in-laws you know my biological parents are tremendous and I just I feel like I could not possibly be more blessed in my life right now than I am. So I hope you like my love story. It was a love story now with a, with a happy ending and kind of on my soapbox about adoption at the moment, but another one of those subjects that a lot of people don't particularly like to talk about. So we're going we're gonna to do a lot more of those. Coming up here pretty soon I'm going to be talking about bullying and um, hopefully some of the ways that we can we can go about um, cutting some of that out you know it just it's a ridiculous ridiculous thing so we're gonna um, maybe next week or the week after that we're gonna we're gonna go into some of that so uh, if anybody has any questions please don't hesitate to contact me and um, I think we're gonna wrap it up for today uh, so we, please everybody be safe and um, God bless you. Until next time.